Remember that hit meme from 2023, there is nothing we can do with Napoleon? Well the paleontology community has still not recovered from Velociraptor, so I think I have the right to mention this meme today in relation to the island of St. Helena in the Atlantic Ocean. If you want to exile your enemy, St. Helena is the place to do such a thing, being 4,000 miles away from France and over 1,000 miles away from the mainland. The island is 121 square kilometers or 46.7 meters squared, being formed 14 million years ago with its last eruption being around 7 million years ago. Having never been connected to another landmass, the island was colonized exclusively by sea life, seabirds, and plants and insects, which were transported by birds and bird poop, or sea currents. This has led to St. Helena being colonized by a variety of tropical plants, such as the St. Helena dwarf ebony and the St. Helena redwood, which are unrelated to the redwoods of California or the ebony trees. The St. Helena cloud forests come in at altitudes of approximately 700 meters to 820 meters, and cover about 16 hectares of land, preserving approximately 250 endemic species on the island. Ironically, these small fragmentary forests make up one sixth of the UK's total endemic biodiversity within their territories and the mainland United Kingdom. In these seven million years, we have evidence of two mass extinctions occurring on the island, the first being at the end of the Pleistocene era, which we'll explore a little more later, and isn't very apparent to paleontologists whether it's just preservation bias, or whether all of these species went extinct around the same time. As well as this, we have subfossils from the Holocene era, when humans finally arrived in the 1500s, which show that there was a mass die-out of most endemic species on St. Helena during the 1500s. Now we're going to get a little bit into the history of St. Helena, all the way back in 1502, the islands were first discovered by Portuguese explorer Joao de Nova, who named the island after St. Helena of Constantinople, the mother of Constantine the Great of the Roman Empire. Honestly, all respect to Joao for not naming the island after himself. Oh, come on, man. Well, at least we know he actually discovered St. Helena, right? Oh, this guy was a total fraud. I, I don't know why I tried to big him up. Anyway, the island had plenty of resources, having fresh water, trees, easy to pick on birds, fertile land for plants and livestock, being pretty much ideal for anyone who would come to the island. No permanent settlement by the Portuguese was ever made, and British ships would soon take advantage of the island to ambush Portuguese ships who wished to resupply there. The Dutch claimed the island for themselves in 1633, but quickly lost interest. In 1657, a person my friend is directly descended from, Oliver Cromwell, allowed the East India Company to run the island. I'm sure granting the East India Company a lot of power will never backfire. And by 1659, the British officially settled on the island. From here we have some pretty weird claiming issues. The Dutch did try to take the island, but it remained fortified by the British garrisons put there so, for the most part, nothing really changed. And after the horrifying wars that changed Europe in the late 1700s and early 1800s, a certain Frenchman, Napoleon, would be exiled for a second time, but this time would have no hopes of returning. Starting in 1815, he would live there until 1821, really a blink of an eye in the island's long history, but a truly memorable place for the once great general and emperor of the French. He was guarded by 2,100 soldiers, and the British were so paranoid of him escaping, they actually claimed Tristan de Cunha, where they also had a garrison, to make sure that the French would not be able to use it as a launching pad to invade St. Helena and take back their beloved emperor. Maybe in his time walking along the steep cliffs and above the deep ravines, maybe he even saw some pincers from a giant St. Helena earwig. Many cargo ships would request to get a glimpse of Napoleon, and with his declining health and death in 1821, an end of an era in Europe truly came about. But the change the French Revolution and Napoleon brought to Europe is beyond the scope of this video. In the late 1790s, people on the island had observed the decline of the interior vegetation of endemic plants. 
By 1833, a series of early experiments by a professor and his assistant led to the creation of a plant nursery to restore habitat on the island. Honestly, pretty impressive for its time. By the end of that year in 1833, the administration of St. Helena was transferred from the East India Company to the Crown, another shift in British history. The population on the island would grow all the way to 1,000 people. Today, however, St. Helena's population is almost at 4,000. The last glacial maximum saw a weird trend in two endemic St. Helena birds, with two species going extinct at around the same time, these being the St. Helena shearwater and St. Helena dove. As the climate heated, the St. Helena shearwater went extinct, perhaps due to the marine heat waves and other events caused by an increased ocean temperature. St. Helena likely had its own equivalent of the dodo. The St. Helena dove was a short-winged, large-bodied, flightless bird that was originally assumed to have gone extinct in 1502. However, with no records of the bird, some theorise it went extinct in the Pleistocene. Considering all of the remains are found from the middle to late Pleistocene period, this is kind of supported, though more data is needed to be collected to truly understand when the St. Helena dove went extinct. All of the other animals in this video are either alive today or went extinct during the Holocene extinction event in the 1500s. The best example of island gigantism on St. Helena is the St. Helena giant earwig, which was a recently extinct species and the largest earwig of all time. It only came out after rain and was primarily nocturnal. With very few predators on the island, it evolved a larger body, and so the opportunity arose for the St. Helena hupo to hunt it, probably being its only predator. They lived in areas such as seabird colonies and the interior forests of the island, feeding omnivorously off other insects and decaying plant matter. The female specimens collected and kept at London Zoo were noted for being incredible parents, a trait we are still learning about today in insects. In 1904, huge interest developed in the St. Helena earwig due to its size and unique behaviours, though they seem to have massively declined, with the last pincers found in 1962 and the last alive specimen seen in 1967. It seems the introduced mantids and centipedes, as well as the rodents that were introduced to the island, led to predation and disease wiping out the St. Helena earwig. They disappeared at a similar time to the endemic seabird colonies. Today, St. Helena's museum possesses one intact specimen, with others being kept in collections across the globe. In 2014, they were declared extinct, and today the largest species is the Australian giant earwig. What would these videos be without a flightless rail? The St. Helena rail was in fact pretty unique, having reasonably reduced wings, but not in comparison to other rails, and it was about the size of a New Zealand weka, perhaps suggesting it was a rather recent addition to the island. We can see this in the far more reduced Inaccessible Island and Ascension Island rail's wings. Its strong legs and toes would have helped it balance on the steep hills and cliffs of the island, so perhaps its more robust wings helped it balance. It probably lived off snails, bird eggs, other flightless birds, and the St. Helena earwig, definitely going extinct in the early 1500s due to invasive rats and mice. You know what's better than one flightless rail? Two! The St. Helena Crake was a descendant of Ballion's Crake, or the Marsh Crake. It was once again an easy picking for invasive species, and so this elusive bird entered the void of obscurity. The large St. Helena petrel, or St. Helena gadfly petrel, went extinct in 1502 due to overpredation and invasive pests, and the small St. Helena petrel, or Olsen's petrel, or Bulwer's petrel, was a smaller species of St. Helena petrel, also found on the island. They seem to have coexisted to a degree with the St. Helena giant earwig, but declined rapidly along with them. While the St. Helena earwig survived for a little while longer, the St. Helena petrels completely disappeared. The Hupu is a widespread, iconic bird species found in Africa and Eurasia, with two living species today, the one extinct species 
being the elusive St. Helena Hupo, only officially described in 1963, at least 323 years after its last sighting. The St. Helena Hupo occupied the woodlands and scrubland. The animal is speculated to be a predator of the St. Helena earwig. This also extended to lizards, frogs, crickets, and perhaps even some seeds. It likely lived a terrestrial life as a predator on the island, almost definitely not retaining the ability to fly. Its robust legs, small wings, and tough skull all allowed for a lifestyle otherwise not allowed for mainland hupus. The remains of the St. Helena hupu are incomplete, so estimates of the height or even certainty of flightlessness cannot be said. But an estimated weight of 101 to 145 grams makes it far larger than the largest population of mainland hupo. The Madagascan hupo is around 57 to 91 grams in weight, showing a similar phenomena of slight island gigantism. The St. Helena hupo is known from fragmented fossils, such as skull fragments, a left humerus, one femur, and a coracoid, which upon further examination showed significant differences from Eurasian hupos. They likely went extinct in the same way most fauna on St. Helena did. Invasive cats and dogs made it an easy prey. Mice and rats could eat their eggs. Furthermore, habitat destruction in the form of invasive molds and insects, along with deforestation from humans, led to a huge decline in general for their habitat of woodlands. The extinction range is pretty large due to how elusive it was in life, anywhere from 1502 to their last recorded sighting in 1550. Even then, it may not have survived. Even then, it may have survived until 1640, putting a pretty pu putting a pretty large range on this animal's extinction date. The Saint Helena plover or wirebird is the only endemic extant bird found on Saint Helena. Every other one has been wiped out, as we have seen. It has a similar appearance to the Madagascan plover, but lacks some colouring and is a little larger. It's around 15 centimetres in size, meanwhile the Madagascan plover is 8 to 9 centimetres. The Kitlet's plover is its closest relative and is smaller. They forage for most of their days, eating insects such as beetles and caterpillars. Since the St. Helena plover tends to live in open forest clearings, the deforestation on St. Helena has somehow benefited the bird overall. Conservation has helped the species increase from 200 adults in 2006 to 560 in 2016. The IUCN has upgraded the species from critically endangered to vulnerable since the population growth. However, island activity such as proposed wind farms in important bird breeding areas and the St. Helena airport pose a huge threat to the bird. Feral cats, invasive plants, construction and farming are also a huge pressure for this species to be under. It is the national bird of St. Helena, and pretty much the only living bird they can choose from, being found on the island's local five pence coins and their coat of arms and flag. Honestly, another awesome example of how islands can celebrate their endemic wildlife. On St. Helena today, five non-endemic species have been eliminated, along with eight endemic species completely eradicated. Furthermore, 34 species have been introduced by human beings. The sheer number of human-made destruction is astounding. The shadow of Napoleon and his legacy looms over St. Helena today. But I hope I have given you something to remember the island for that is different from this very significant man. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you to my Patreons up on the screen now, and for all of the support in this new sort of mini-series I'm doing on Atlantic Islands. I hope you guys will like and subscribe, and more content like this will be coming your way. Thank you very much.